The rest of us are headed to Mark 13 to continue our journey through things to come. Let's pause for another moment of prayer and ask the Spirit of God to illuminate our hearts with the Word of God. Father, thank you for the way, the marvelous way in which you reveal yourself on the pages of Scripture and you very clearly teach us what you expect of us. So give us a, a whole, holy boldness. Give us a soberness about life that this is not a game. Comfort as only your word can comfort to give substan substantial hope over the issues of life as we await the soon return of the Lord Jesus. Might we wait in faithfulness and great hope. We pray in his matchless name. I'll take your Bible and join me in Mark 13, if you would. We're continuing Jesus giving us eschatological insight, more insight about the end times. This is part two in Mark 13. He's going to extend to us the significance of the Great Tribulation in verses 14 to 23, the significance of the Great Tribulation. Now, those of you that know me well know that I'm not much of a sports buff, but I know that there are plenty of you that are. If you are a sports fan, or even if you have spent a minimal amount of time viewing sports on television, you know that quite often the last few minutes, or even at times seconds of the game, can be the most dramatic and heart palpitating. These moments are sometimes packed with intense activity on the part of the players and the coaches and are often filled with daring or desperate strategies, whatever it takes to win the game. Every losing football team has its two-minute offense where normal plays and procedures are set aside and risks are taken in order to score quickly. Likewise, in basketball, even the Dedicated fan never ceases to be amazed at how much can happen in the final 60 seconds when across the court they throw the ball and just hoping they might make score another few points. Any fan who's worthy of the title can remember game after game when last second heroics or errors have brought either the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. The final moments can be so crucial and so unique. So it is with those final moments of man's rule and existence on this earth. After thousands of years of human history, it's the final seven that are so crucial and so unique. Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation, Jacob's trouble, goes by various names depending on what text you're in no game. It's deadly, serious, spiritual battle between the Lord and Satan himself. It decides who will be worshipped as ruler of the world and determines the eternal destiny of billions of human beings. In one sense, this contest is simply a continuation on of what's been going on ever since the fall of Satan and man in Genesis 3. But it's carried on with much greater intensity because it's clear to all that time's running out. The playbook's out the window. Unlike many sporting events, there's no question about the outcome of this spiritual contest between the Lord and Satan because we've read the back of the book and the Lord wins. Amen? He returns to the planet not as the meek baby of Bethlehem, but the conquering king of glory. He returns as king of kings, lord of all earthly lords, the righteous and powerful ruler of the universe. But it's the events of those seven years leading up to that triumph that we want to investigate this morning through the lens of Mark and the words of our Savior Jesus. So we return to Jesus' sermon that is known as the Olivet Discourse. These words 
are given on Mount Olivet, which is the place where Jesus' feet will touch down again. It's the longest reply to any question ever asked him in the Gospels. Jesus has just told us in verses 1 through 13 about the devastation of the temple because they came out of the, the physical earthly temple of worship in Jerusalem, which was apostate. Jesus has already condemned the false religion. He condemned the false leaders and now condemned the place of false religion and as his disciples look at the glistening of these huge ornate stones by King Herod. Aren't those beautiful? And Jesus declares, not one of them is going to remain on the other. Utter decimation. He concluded that paragraph by telling us that his followers would be hated by all for his name's sake. And yet he that endures to the end will be saved unto eternal life and finally crowned with glorification, to put it in the words of Revelation 2.10. That decimation of the temple, from the moment Jesus uttered it, would occur within about 20 years, foreshadowing an even greater tribulation. So after initial birth pangs, Jesus kind of shifts focus to a major undeniable event. He's already said the end of the age will consist of false teachers. The end of the age, there'll be a lot of false messiahs, wars, rumors of war, earthquakes, famines, and violent persecution of believers, which are just the beginnings of birth pangs. I even found myself last night as I was highlighting and underlining my notes and thinking about that, that earthquake. That's pretty scary. I, I did a Google search. When was our last earthquakes here, and what were they rated and whatnot. Cataclysmic events. Ain't nothing happened like what's going to happen in this great tribulation with all of its earthquakes and the wars. So the rest of the chapter forms the heart of the Olivet Discourse in Mark and naturally divides into two sections. There's today's section on unparalleled trouble in the Great Tribulation. Specifically, the abomination that causes desolation and then next week's ending paragraph of the chapter that pictures the return of the Son of Man in glory from verses 24 to the end. And it's a glorious return that we anticipate with eagerness. Just a little reminder as we study the doctrine of end times that as with every other doctrine, it has to be pieced together as we uh, go throughout Scripture. One reason why today's Scripture reading was in Second Thessalonians. And then we're going to run to Daniel during our study. Because it's been six years since my faithful predecessor preached through Daniel here at Grace Bible Church. It's been a long time. And so we've got to uh, remind ourselves of what we learned back a half a dozen years ago. The Olivet Discourse as recorded in Matthew's account that takes up two chapters, not just one, gives Christ eschatological projections for two main groups in this big event of the tribulation. There's Israel and then there's the Gentile nations. Those will be crucial to our interpreting the text this morning. We've got to keep those in mind because there's going to be a national turning of Israel and many Gentiles that will come to faith. Utter decimation that people wouldn't come without that. You think about what's going on in the Church of Jesus Christ over in Ukraine when there is real, real war going on. The church is vibrant and they know their message. We're not here to survive. We're here to get the gospel out because to be absent from the body is to be in the Lord's presence. We've got nothing to lose. Matthew presents Israel with her rightful king, King Jesus. This is a transitional time in the Gospels where the Jews are rejecting their Messiah. That's why the church is introduced in chapters 16 and chapters 18 of Matthew. Only two times does Matthew mention through the words of Jesus the church. There's the great profession that uh, Peter makes. Thou art the Christ. You're the true Messiah that God reveals to him. And then that passage in chapter 18 of Matthew on 
church discipline, how we deal with relationships and set them aright. But since Matthew is not addressing the church, it's addressing the Jews of their rightful king. No rapture is mentioned in Matthew or Mark, though it's taught elsewhere. So we'd have to we just kind of mention that, and that's why for tea time this afternoon you got a nice little bulletin insert as you try to use the picture and put in place the events of the end times. There's the rapture of the church in the air, the great snatch, where Jesus' feet are not actually coming back to this planet. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. There's going to be seven years of utter decimation. It's the last half, the, the second three and a half years, that's the worst of the tribulation. Jesus comes back and he does battle with his enemies, sets up his throne on the throne of David. That's why you know the, the you at the end of our section today these are those who are watching for Christ's return. It's whatever generation is going to go into the tribulation. We don't know when the tribulation is going to occur. We don't know when the rapture is going to occur. So we're just waiting. Not quite so fanatical as those believers who go out on their front lawn and jump up and down for rapture practice to see if they missed it. We're as certain as we can be that we're not looking... Necessarily for the undertaker. If the Lord delays his time, we may go to the grave. But if he comes back for his church, there are many in that generation that are not going to see the ashes and the, the worms of the grave. Before the tribulation, immediately followed by the return of Christ. The you is whatever that generation is. Those saved during that time. Church is not to be looking for the tribulation. They're not to be looking for Antichrist. No way does the scripture tell us to be looking for him. Look for Jesus. So why does he tell us about the abomination of desolation? Because he's not coming until this one works his antics. This is that we might be sobered and watchful. One more introductory detail. Over a year ago, in December, from the sacred desk here, this pulpit, we engaged in uh, a sermon I had titled Bible Storyline, where we put together Genesis to Revelation, the whole storyline of Scripture, so that as we got ready to read through the Bible together the following year, we could kind of put those pieces together as you read from Genesis through Revelation, the Bible storyline. And it hung on five major epics. The first big event of Scripture is what? It's creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it's not too much further, just two chapters later, chapter 3 of Genesis, you've got the big epic of the fall. So we move from creation to fall. And in the same chapter, there's decimation through sin. You've got the first messianic promise in Genesis 3.15 that there's coming a one who is going, going to bruise the head of the serpent fatally. Yes, the serpent's going to bruise his heel, but he's going to give a death blow to the serpent's head. And so from Genesis 3.15 and the rest of the Old Testament is promise. It's prophecy. Then the redemption that comes through Christ and the gospel accounts and the grand culmination of the age as the last book of the Bible fills in those gaps along with Thessalonians and Peter. But that third element, that of promise and prophecy, is missing from most contemporary presentations that I hear in our day because a lot of those storylines of Scripture are given from a more uh, covenantal, non-dispensational view of biblical theology. Where's the promise? Where's the prophecy? There is so much scripture that was prophetic that has been fulfilled, and yet there's so much prophecy that 
hadn't been fulfilled, and God is not a renigger on his promises. He always brings to fulfillment that which he has said. Only a consistently literal hermeneutic deals rightly with the prophets, both the major prophets and the minor prophets, not changing how they handle the text when they come to prophetic sections, saying, well, it's all, it's figurative, and there's, there's too much symbolism and revelation. It's the hardest book. No, it's actually a pretty easy book when you understand it's futuristic. So the tribulation is the event Jesus discussed with his disciples that day. It's going to be a time of universal devastation in which the full wrath of God will be unleashed all over the earth. Revelation chapter 6 through 16. It'll be a time of unmitigated evil as the normal restraining power, speaking of the Spirit of God, is withdrawn. 2 Thessalonians 2 7. And demonic activity is permitted to increase. You think this world is bad today, beloved? This is with restraint. Think about this earth in all of its sinfulness without restraint. Well, it, this event that Jesus is going to discuss with his disciples, the church has already been raptured to heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15, John 14, Revelation 3. The good news of salvation is going to be preached to unbelievers through the testimony of 144,000 redeemed Jews. Revelation chapter 7. Two powerful witnesses, Revelation 11. And an angel flying mid-heaven, Revelation 14, 6. And countless numbers of Gentiles who embraced the gospel during that time. It's going to be a hellacious seven years. The gospel glimmers in glorious splendor against the backdrop of wickedness. God is still on His throne. Dear friends, may you keep from being deceived and yet stand firm in the hope of your eternal salvation as we look at three different groups. You can pick them out as we begin in verse 14. Mark 13, 14. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who's on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house and the one who's in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray it may not happen in the winter, for those days will be a time of tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to, Behold, here is the Christ. Or behold, he is here. Don't believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed. Behold, I have told you everything in advance. So let's march through thinking about those those three groups that Jesus mentioned. You don't get very far in verse 14 before you're introduced to this abomination of desolation standing where it should not be. This is the perverted Antichrist in the first half of verse 14. The disciples still had hopes that their master would immediately usher into his messianic kingdom. Remember how many times they say, is it now, Lord? Is it now? They're, they're, they're on the end of a leash and they just can't hold back. They had no idea there'd be a delay. That was the furthest thing from their minds. Still had no clear concept of the coming of the church that would be birthed in Acts chapter 2, where there's Jew and Gentile no more known by their distinction, but their togetherness in the body of Christ. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't get that. It wouldn't be till Paul came that he'd fill in some of those gaps in their understanding about the church. 
when, you, when we come to prophetic passages, in the, especially in the Old Testament, the prophets used what I, what I was teaching in our hermeneutics class on Tuesdays this winter, they'd use what we call telescoping in predictive prophecy. When you present two events and not seeing a gap in between. It's kind of like, say you were uh, going up the five and you see this mountain range. Hey, that's gorgeous. It's got nice snow cap on the top. And the closer you get to it, you find out there's not one peak, there's two and a big valley in between. So from distance, it looks like one. And yet the closer you get to it, you see, it's kind of like when I used to lose all hope when I was mountain climbing on Mount Katahdin. I think you're just getting to the top. And when you get there, it's like you got another one to go over. You see that in Scripture. In similar vein, in the progress of Revelation, the prophets didn't see that there was a gap between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. They didn't see him coming as the baby of Bethlehem that was prophesied in Bethlehem and coming back again. Messiah's first coming came with good tidings, and his second coming is unto judgment. They're all combined together. Both events combined in Isaiah 11, 1 to 4, and Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, for those of you that have taken notes to be a Berean in search and make sure your pastor's not leading you astray on this. Isaiah 11, 1 to 4, and Isaiah 61, 1 to 2 would just be a sampling of how we've got Two events with a large gap, a large delay in between the first and second coming. So many think, as he just told them, that this beautiful temple you see with these massive stones, one on the other, it's going to be decimated. It's going to be decimated within 20 years. It's the early 50s when Mark wrote this text. And by 70 AD, there is literal fulfillment, but it's still just foreshadowing more drastic events to come. A lot of Bible scholars, students of Scripture, see utter fulfillment in 70 AD when Jerusalem was sacked. This is preterism. Especially when they, you read Luke 21, 20 to 24, and you know the Jerusalem's going to be surrounded by armies. They were indeed surrounded by armies. Nothing like the nations that are coming after them in the future. So be aware as you're reading Scripture. Be aware when you go to your commentaries. One of my favorite study Bibles, the Reformation Study Bible, is just wrong when they find fulfillment in 70 A.D. You go to 2 Thessalonians, where we're going to go back to this morning, like we had in our scripture reading. you got some of the grandest teaching on the effectual call. Praise God that you're right here, even though we got to correct a little bit of theology here. It's the future we are looking to, not the past. Like I mentioned in regards to Revelation, Revelation is a futuristic book. Those seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation 2 and 3, those were literal churches. But they are not epics throughout church history where we teach church history uh, because they're just giving us the gist. These were real places. So Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, he's talking to his disciples then. So the question is, did it occur or is it yet future? They just asked for a sign. You want a sign? One of the most conspicuous signs of Jesus coming is in verse 14. It's the abomination of desolation. Halfway through the tribulation, three and a half years later, Jesus comes. So once it starts... Once the church is raptured out, you can kind of start your timetable. When the tribulation begins, okay, we've got seven years. We know that halfway through the tribulation, this desolation is occurring. You think the first half of the tribulation is bad, you just hold on until the second half. 
and then the immediate return of King Jesus. So keep your finger here and run over to Second uh, Thessalonians real quick. We, um, I know I don't often remember to shepherd you and remind you to open your Bibles during Scripture reading, and that ought to be a good habit, even though we don't have it up on the screen. So we're looking in our Bibles, and so we're going back to what we heard read this morning. In Second Thessalonians 2, in verse number 3, Now, here, here's why we're making a big deal. We're pulling over and parking a little bit in this text of this one event this morning. So many warnings from Jesus. Beware. Understand. Hear. And what's Paul do? Paul does the same thing to the church at Thessalonica when he says, Let no one in any way deceive you, verse 3. For it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. You know, when people are wondering, did we miss out on Jesus' return? You remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, there were those in the church at Thessalonica that thought they'd missed out on the rapture. You know, their loved ones had died. And he said, well, they didn't miss out. They're actually there ahead of you. They're not going to be raptured out. To be absent from this body is to be in the Lord's presence. So there's, there's this confusion that ought not be there. We're expected to understand this. You know, he talks about the son of destruction, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? The, uh, uh, the, the telling here in the, in the Greek language is in a tense that it's ongoing. This wasn't a one-shot deal where somebody, the congregation fell asleep while Paul's preaching to them and never heard it again. They missed their eschatology lesson. Time and again, he repeated this as he was instructing them. I was telling you these things. Verse 6, and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Literal event going to take place, not had taken place. This supports the fact that the abomination of desolation that Jesus is instructing his disciples on in Mark 13 refers to the eschatological Antichrist, capital A Antichrist. Even though John tells us in his letters that Antichrist doctrine has always been around. It's, it's alive and well, deceiving many people, the, where people get wrong views of the deity of Christ. Don't be led astray. But there is a real eschatological Antichrist coming. 70 AD, if you want to say it foreshadowed, fine, it foreshadowed. It did not fulfill. It contains some features of the Great Tribulation. But when Going back to our text here, when, when Jesus assures them to see it, Verse 14, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not be, it looks forward to a definite observable event, but the question is when. This phrase, this text, this event clearly connects with the prophecy of Daniel 9, which we haven't been to since the fall of six years ago. So run back there real quick. Uh, where are we going? Daniel. Daniel 7. Daniel 7 is a text that has to be understand, uh, understood. It needs to be clear in our hearts and minds because Jesus refers to it. Paul refers to it. John refers to it. It's what's been Daniel nine twenty four to twenty seven has been referred to as the backbone of Bible prophecy. We need to understand it. And hear me again, dear friends. 
I take eschatology serious like I take all doctrines serious. I'm, I'm not willing to say it's a secondary doctrine. I don't believe believers' baptism is a secondary doctrine. There's a lot of doctrine. I won't allocate to a tertiary issue because when you say it's secondary, that means it's not important. Now let's understand, as I constantly teach as well, it's not the gospel. There's gospel issues I will fight for. It's a hill worth dying on. And when precious brothers are just wrong about their eschatology, I'm not going to fight them. I'm with a smile on, coffee's on me. Going to let them know you're just plain wrong, brother. And when we're going up through, zipping up through that first layer of clouds, instantly you'll have perfect, that perfect knowledge that one was right and one was wrong. It's no big deal. I don't have to win the argument this side. And so I, I want you to hear that because a lot of times we are not winsome in our theological discussions where we're castigating real believers who may be wrong, but they're not the enemy. It's not a gospel issue. It's not the deity of Christ at stake. But it's very important. The beginning, uber importance. Six literal days of creation out of nothing. And don't you think that God is just as clear at how he's going to bring it all down for a landing? I think it is important. So please just, just hear that balance. So, again, back to the text. Stop meddling and get back to preaching, Parker. Uh, Daniel 9. Look at verse 24, if you would. 924. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you are to know. You think we could... Have a bunch of question marks? Well, we're supposed to have a lot less question marks in our mind. So you are to know and to discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks of Messiah will be cut off and have nothing the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. Abomination, bedouglam, denotes an object of disgust, something loathsome, foul, detestable, an abomination to God, and of desolation describes the effect produced, causing something to be deserted. In the Old Testament, abomination denotes idolatry or sacrilege, you know, the high places of Baal, and et cetera, et cetera. The book of Revelation, abomination describes the wickedness of Babylon in Revelation 17, 4 and 5. You know, these weeks that Daniel prophesies are weeks of years, and we don't have time to get into our uh, eschatological lessons this morning. But just stick with me for a moment. You ever read the introductory pages to whatever study Bible you use, whether it's a Mac study or Reformation study, or just make sure it's a good study Bible. And you read those introductory pages before you read a book of the Bible to orient your mind, because there's gold there. I remember years ago discipling a brother in the church, and I, I think we as a church for his graduation from high school had given him a, a MacArthur study Bible. And I'd asked him, I said, you read your introductory pages before you go to the Gospel of Matthew or Mark or wherever you're studying? I didn't even know they were in there. I said, well, look at it. Two or three pages of gold where Bible teachers will help you understand. They're not inspired. They're men, but they'll help you understand the text. How about Daniel and the dating of Daniel? Because... I believe that we can be quite sure that Daniel was written a lot earlier than scholarly skeptics think that it was written. 
because a few hundred years after Daniel was written, historical event of Epiphanes. Antiochus IV, Epiphanes. They date Daniel in the same day as Antiochus Epiphanes, who defiled the temple in 167. But that was too many years forward. This was prophecy. It was a profaning of the temple. But it was not a destruction. When Jesus said that to his disciples in, in Mark 13, not one stone is going to be left upon itself. It's going to be utter decimation. There was not utter decimation. So again, the question. Past fulfillment of the abomination of desolation or future? Antiochus, you say he wanted foreshadows? Fine. He foreshadows. He does not fulfill. Yes, he wanted to erect an idol of Zeus in the temple. But the final capital A Antichrist, not Antiochus, but Antichrist, will exalt himself as God and demand worship of all, Revelation 13, 7 and 8. So, not Antiochus in the past, but Antichrist in the future is the fulfillment of prophecy. Daniel is not written in the intertestamental years. He was written so many years before that. He, his contemporaries are Ezekiel and Habakkuk and Jeremiah and Zephaniah. It's before 530 B.C. Again, as we go back to extract what Jesus means by what he said. You're going to see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be. Let the reader understand. Antichrist will, as Matthew 24, 25, the parallel account say, explicitly states that he's going to profane the holy place, the sacred sanctuary itself, and that this is the fulfillment of Daniel, Matthew tells us. In the Old Testament tabernacle, there was the Holy of Holies, an inner sanctuary where the presence of God came down and dwelt. There is, from that point on, finally Solomon builds a temple for God to be worshipped. David wasn't allowed. Yes, there was a sacking of the temple in 70 A.D., they're already, I've been, I, I've sat over there in the old city of Jerusalem where they've got all the instruments in place for temple worship. Mark was clearly thinking of a literal and personal antichrist. The antichrist of 2 Thessalonians 2, the antichrist who causes desolation according to Daniel's prophecy. The 70th week, when the prince that shall come shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Daniel 9.27 Daniel and Mark have the same meaning. They're consistent with each other. Jesus says, let the reader understand. In this parenthetical command, also found in Matthew, Jesus calling attention to the prophecy of Daniel. Look at Daniel. Bidding his reader to understand its fullest significance. Because there's going to be a lot of crackpots in church history. Crazy people. you got the egomaniacal Caligula, Roman emperor from AD 37 to 41, who attempted to erect statues of himself in the temple, but that doesn't qualify. Jews didn't flee to the mountains, nor were his statues ever erected. How about the destruction of the temple by Titus, which is the common preterist position? That doesn't qualify either. It, too, departs substantially from Mark 13. The only meaning it can have of abomination that causes desolation is this man of lawlessness that Paul, too, comes to tell the Thessalonians about. The specific man during a specific time of tribulation, capital T tribulation, 
Both texts depict a blasphemous antichrist who will do a scandalous deed that will trigger the return of the Lord. Like I said at the beginning of the message, these words that Jesus was telling his present-day disciples in the first century are not necessarily who would be going into this time to recognize. Future readers of Scripture, the generation immediately prior to the return of Christ, when they see this man do that desecration halfway through the tribulation, know that Jesus is coming in the few short years, even though it feels like the millennium during the tribulation forever. So we've got the perverted Antichrist at the beginning of verse 14, and we had to spend a little time there. The, the, Next point goes pretty quick. You see, there's a there's a, a lot of significance in just half a verse. You move to panic people in the same verse. From second half of verse 14 all the way down through verse 18. All these reiterating time after time here. There's one safe reaction to the abomination and desolation. Escape with urgency. Don't try to save your hide. Don't try to collect your belongings. Don't try to save your loved ones. Be gone. He says, flee to the mountains. They must immediately take flight due to the bitter persecution, especially of the Jewish people. As you study prophecy, you study the time of great tribulation, you understand that there's two people groups, the Gentile nations and the Jews. The Jews are going to be extremely persecuted. Even though the whole world is decimated by Antichrist, it's them particularly. Zechariah 13, 8 and 9. Zechariah declared, only a third of the Jewish population living in Judea will survive. Talk about decimation. And those who do survive are going to come to saving faith because they're refined by persecution. There's no use resisting this God who is raining down His wrath. Flee to Him in saving faith. Flee to the mountains. Get out of Dodge. If you're on your housetop, you know, the architecture and usage of buildings in the ancient Near East is very different than ours. You know, I always keep my eyes on the shingles. We've got to go up and clean the chimney and watch out for your asphalt because then you've got to replace your shingles. Well, it's very different. You've got flat roofs that we saw back in chapter 2 of Mark's Gospel where they're ripping the roof apart to put down their paralytic friend in front of Jesus because he couldn't get through the door. Jewish people generally would reach their roof by outside stairway. Use it for different purposes, for sleeping, keeping watch, worship, proclaiming tidings. So if a man happened to be up there when this crisis breaks out, don't rush down and into your house to get all your valuables. Flee without even stopping to remove anything from your house for flight. Say you're in the field working that day. Similar urgency conveyed. Now, evenings could get pretty cold every couple of years. Jerusalem has, has a, a big snowfall and whatnot. So don't even grab your coat. The danger is too great. There's no time for delay. Life itself is at stake, as we mentioned in a moment under our last point. Jesus says, if you're pregnant in that day, woe are you. Thinks to be you. This is not a condemnation like the woes on the scribes and Pharisees. this is He's pitying them. This time of motherhood ought to be a time of great joy, and it's going to be a pathetic handicap because you can't waddle up fast enough with your family members to get up to the mountains. Hopefully it doesn't happen in winter, he says. Winter's rainy season over there. The rain, swollen streams would definitely add to the danger and unable to glean from the countryside when you flee. You can't even grab any vittles going through people's fields, grabbing some barley. Nope. So in summary of what we've seen so far, Antichrist fury against Israel will produce a holocaust far more severe than the Roman assault back in AD 70. 
Their flight that day merely foreshadowed a future flight. Hear me. Important details from the Olivet Discourse and other biblical prophecies were not fulfilled. There was no destruction of the nations that attack Jerusalem. Zechariah 12. There was no visible return of Christ. Zechariah 14. Mark 13. Acts 1. Third, no judgment of the nations by the Lord Jesus. Matthew 25. And fourth issue, there was no establishment of His earthly reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years. Revelation 24 to 6. As we meander past here to that last sec- segment, we see the protected elect in verses 19 to 23. The protected elect. Now, when we come to the term in Scripture, tribulation, many times tribulation is is small t. Did Jesus not say in John 16, 33, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Life is hard in a fallen, sinful world. It's painful, and many times it just sucks. And yet we've got to fight for joy because we're redeemed. Romans 5, 3. We are commanded to exult in our tribulations, the difficulties on this earth. You get to the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Here, it's a technical term. Specific seven years of judgment, tribulation. This is the, you know, when we talk about the great tribulation, though it refers to the seven years, it especially refers to the second half. In no other time in the past or in future history will there be so much suffering and universal destruction as in the second half of the seven years of Great Tribulation. There's more torture and misery unleashed than occurred during World War II, which ended in an atomic holocaust. Much of the Bible's last book, Revelation, is devoted to it, along with portions of Daniel and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. God still has a future for Israel and during those coming seven years she'll once again be the chief focus of God's activity. Church is in heaven. It's an event that is as sure as Jesus' second coming. This is what is referred to as the 70th week of Daniel that we read about in Daniel 9. The time of Jacob's trouble that Jeremiah speaks of. First half's going to be horrible, but the second, that much worse. If you were to look at the just Revelation's account, John the Apostle's accounting of how devastating, it includes the following. A great earthquake that will devastate the earth, Revelation 6, 12 to 17. Hail and fire will consume a third of the earth's vegetation. You think famines in our day are bad? A third of the ocean will be turned to blood. A third of fresh water will be poisoned. A third of the sun, moon, and stars darkened. Countless de- <laughs> Things are scary enough in the bright lights. Extra scary at night. Countless demons released from bondage to terrorize mankind. A third of the earth population killed. Another great earthquake will kill several thousand people. Revelation 11.13. Incurable sores causing people great pain. An entire sea turned to blood and all sea creatures will die. The rivers turn to blood. The earth experience extreme heat. Darkness will engulf the world. The Euphrates will dry up. And a final global earthquake will cause massive changes to the earth's appearance. Clearly cataclysmic events. Of that magnitude and succession, it's never occurred in human history. They await the fulfillment in the final days just prior to Jesus' return and the establishment of his millennial kingdom. Matter of fact, Jesus reminds them. Notice it, verse uh, 19. 
Those days will be a time of tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will be. Flood was pretty devastating, was it not? It's going to be worse. Unparalleled in human history. This is a significant statement of a significant span of time of the most significant event of tribulation ever to occur. It'll literally be the tribulation, the great one, Revelation 7, 14. Those who restrict the reference to 70 AD must combine this tribulation to that siege, and it just doesn't measure up. One commentator said, this assertion is much too emphatic for a siege. It is clear that the thought of verse 19 is eschatological, unquote. It is so bad, Jesus tells us, that unless the Lord had shortened it, Jehovah God of the Old Covenant, we need to remind even in our tribulations, little t tribulations, that He's on His throne, amen? They need a reminder too that He has graciously decreed a limitation of those days. Literally, He amputated them, mutated, or mutilated, begins with M, right? Strong figurative statement. He's forcefully acted not to permit them to be extended to the full length that human passions would have carried them. And notice the motive. It is for the elect's sake. I'm trying to behave myself and not step up on my soapbox on uh, God's elective favor on His own, which would take us another five hours or whatnot. But you got it in verse 20, you got it in verse 22, you got it in verse 27. God acts on behalf of true believers during the Great Tribulation. What's keeping the brethren over in Ukraine going? God's on the throne. They've got a gospel vision, which changes everything. It doesn't minimize or take away the pain and devastation, but it sure does help them manage it because His grace is sufficient to cause them to persevere. So Jesus again says, if anyone um, says to you, he marks these messages directly aimed at believers in Christ. Behold, here's the Christ, or behold, he is here. Don't believe him. Stick your fingers in your ears. One put it this way, incredulity is sometimes a Christian duty. Well, what's incredulity? Unbelief. Sometimes this is a virtue. And in the tribulation for true believers, unbelief is the way to go. You see their miraculous signs, don't believe a one of them. Believe what he has revealed over your experience. False Christ, false prophets prophesied, they're promised. They're going to offer you great signs and wonders. Astonishment. They're startling. They're amazing. They catch your attention. You look at how this works out even in our day, not of true signs and wonders in the biblical sense, but people are prone to the new. The exciting, the wow, the dazzling factor. It's something that's novel. They want to get in on it. Upshoot ministries, mega gatherings. It's energetic. Don't fall for it. You say, okay, what's the implication of the text? What's the application? Is theology just to discuss how many angels dance on the head of a needle? What does this matter? Verse 23. Take heed. Behold, I have told you everything in advance. The purpose that those people come along, the, the Antichrist, is to lead astray, to divert from the path of truth. So this is the third time Jesus says to them, be on guard. Said it in verse 5. Reiterate it in verse 9. Says it here again in verse 23 present imperative command, making it your standing duty. Pay attention. Keep watch. Stop snoozing. Don't neglect to be alert to danger. The mark of obedience and faithfulness is watchfulness. Not date setting for the future, but obedience now. Right after this event is the second coming. 
one of the most Bible's most intriguing, provocative, and sobering truths that both believers and unbelievers must carefully consider and their eternal implications. If you're in Christ today, you've come to faith, you've turned from your sin and biblical repentance, placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus, this is the realization of God's promise and your hope. When the Bible uses the word hope, it's not a question mark, it's an exclamation point. It's a certainty. Where there is rescue, there is reward, and forever in His presence. That's how the First Thessalonians 4 rapture passages used. Comfort one another with these words. They didn't miss out on presence with the Lord. They, they, they skirted the, the rapture and got into God's presence before you who are alive. Comfort each other. Absence in the body is to be in His presence. It fills you with joy and anticipation. Because of then, we can endure now with His persevering grace. But if you're outside of Christ, this is a terrifying promise of divine judgment. At Jesus' return, He not only gathers His own to Himself, all the thousands that have come to faith in Christ in this time of tribulation, but he destroys his enemies and casts them into eternal hell. Only those who have called upon him in saving faith are saved from eternal wrath. If you have not come to Christ, today is the day of salvation. Come to him today. Flee to Jesus. Escape the wrath. Receive his pardon and his forgiveness. You say, well, I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow's the devil's day. You'll never get around to it. Please, talk to us. We'd love to introduce you to Christ. We've spent some time in prophecy and, and eschatology. Back in 95, a mentor, long-distance mentor, I've got a lot of Charles Ryrie's books, and he'd written a foreword to an eschatology book. So this was 95. It looked pretty several years ago. And he was saying about his day, Dr. Ryrie said, the last several decades' interest in prophecy seems to have been declining, except when some trouble erupts in the Middle East. This has been detrimental to the well-being of the body of Christ. It's robbed us of an important perspective on life here and now for the knowledge of the future then should affect our actions in the present. To ignore what God says about the future cannot but cloud our insights into the present. Beloved, one of the beauties of Bible prophecy is it helps us see this is not a game. It's sobering. It's hope-filling, but it's sobering. Well, Jesus promised all of his disciples tribulation, little p. Kind of like Chippy, the parakeet, who never saw it coming. One second, he was peacefully perched on his cage. In the next, he was sucked up, washed up, and blown over. Problems began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage. But the phone rang. And she turned to pick it up and she barely said, Hello! When <laughs> Chippy got socked in. Since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet and held Chippy under the running water. And then realizing that Chippy, her parakeet, was Soaked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted the pet with hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days later, after the trauma, the reporter who had initially written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see, how's your bird recovering from getting sucked up, washed up, and blown over? Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing anymore. He just sits and stares. Hard to see why. Or hard not to see why. Sucked in, washed up, blown over. Enough to steal the song from the stoutest heart. 
unless you're in Christ. And you can see the plan that delineates the end from the beginning. Jesus, like the other apostles and prophets, teaches, you're not going to miss it, but don't be misled. That Second Thessalonians passage we read this morning, Paul mildly rebukes the believers at Thessalonica. I was telling you these things time and again right along. Verse 5. He had not only taught that they would not be in judgment, the judgment part of the day of the Lord, the tribulation, but also that there would be no tribulation unless Antichrist first be revealed who will take his seat in the temple, an abomination that leads to desolation. He'd also taught the pre-trib rapture that the church is going to be gone. The tribulation is a very Jewish flavor. Yes, many Gentile nations will come to Christ. Nowhere in Scripture are we told to look for Antichrist to appear, even in Scripture so clear that he must appear before Jesus comes. The saints are just told, look to Jesus. Not for Antichrist, but for Jesus Christ. We're not in tribul the, the great tribulation. We haven't been left behind. So there's a sense in which the church lives in light of imminent return of Jesus for his saints. At any moment, he could take us home might be found us faithful to the end. Father, thank you for your truth. Help us to spend much time studying it, to understand it, to put it into practice that it might be a sobering and comforting hope in our lives. Hope for our own souls and hope for others we have the privilege of affecting for eternity. Lord, for any of our neighbors and co-workers and friends and family that are outside of Jesus, we know our mission to introduce them to the one who took the stinger out of death for us, who conquered death, hell, and the grave on our behalf. Help us to be with evangelistic fervor, reaching others with the gospel of Jesus, while at the same time being comforted by these truths of your perfect plan for your church, that you're on your throne, you're accomplishing your perfect plan. Help us to drive much comfort through it. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's respond in.